Welcome to Live, Work, Thrive. I'm Makayla Birmingham, Scary Mommy Executive Producer, and I will be the moderator for tonight's panel discussion. We are in partnership tonight with Fatherly. So shout out to all the fathers and the moms who have joined us for our conversation. We have a very special episode of Live, Work, Thrive this evening brought to you by GEICO. Our world famous panelists will discuss rethinking autism and how to help your child thrive. Tonight, we will dive into how our mindset can impact how kids on the spectrum learn and grow. Diagnosis and labeling and how these can work for and against our kids. The importance of life skills for children on the spectrum and identifying the thinking style of your child and how you can pair interests and strength to help them thrive. Let's meet our panelists. Tonight, we are so excited to have with us Dr. Temple Grandin, one of the world's most respected experts in the field of autism and animal behavior and livestock handling. She is a prolific speaker, internationally best-selling author, and professor of animal science at Colorado State University. In 2010, Time 100, an annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world, named her in the heroes category. She was also the subject of the Emmy and Golden Globe winning semi-biographical film, Temple Grandin. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Dr. Grandin. Wonderful to be here. Also with us is Dr. Deborah Moore. Dr. Deborah Moore is a psychologist who has worked extensively with children, teens, and adults on, on the autism spectrum. She is the author of several books. Her second, co-authored by Dr. Temple Grandin, will be released September 21st of this year and is titled Navigating Autism, Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids on the Spectrum. So if anyone's interested, that book is coming out real soon. You can pick up your own copy. Before we get started, I have a couple reminders for the audience. Submit your questions in the comments wherever you are watching, and we may feature your question later on in the show. And also, don't forget to join our mailing list so you don't miss out on any of our upcoming virtual events. Visit scarymommy.com slash liveworkthrive to sign up and stay in touch. Let's get into tonight's topic. So Dr. Grandin, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and when you were first diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum? Well, I was born in 1947, so doctors didn't know very much about autism. When I was two and a half years old, I had no speech and all the symptoms of classic autism. And mother took me into a neurologist. And the neurologist didn't know what autism was, so I was diagnosed as brain damage. But she made sure I, was not, I did not have epilepsy and I was not deaf. You've got a child that's not talking. First thing you've got to do is rule out deafness. Absolutely. And then I went to a very good speech therapy school that two teachers um, taught out of their home. Did a lot of emphasis on turn taking. My speech teacher, when she talked to me, would slow down <coughs> and enunciate hard consonant sounds. Like if she, she'd hold up a cup and she'd go, now say cup. And then she'd say cup. Bah. And she'd go back and forth between saying it regular and saying it slow. Always gave me a chance to use my words. Uh, turn taking. All kinds of little games where I had to learn how to wait and take turns. That's a really important thing to teach kids with autism. And... And I was outside playing all the time. Of course, there was no electronics at this time to get addicted to. And then a little later on, I was about five, then they put the autism label on it. But I, I had the classic symptoms and previous other diagnoses have totally confirmed it. And so Dr. Moore, <laughs> uh, how does, how does uh, the experience Temple had compared to today's methods of diagnosing children? Well, I think we're more aware today, but it still depends on where you live, what kind of community you're in, what kind of resources there are. We've got a long way to go yet. So, you know, when I was in graduate school, we were told we would never meet a child with autism. So we didn't really need to learn too much about it. Wow. <laughs> that was well, the it turned out that you know, the thing about autism is it's very variable. A child can look really bad at two and a half. I looked really terrible at two and a half. And by the time I was four, I was speaking uh, maybe slowly and by five, absolutely, totally fluently verbal. Then you're going, then you have a type of autism where there's no speech delay. Then you have kids that never learn to talk. And the thing is, autism goes all the way. Elon Musk, right here, see these yellow post-it notes? I put those in this book six years ago because I thought he was autistic. 
Now he's told everybody on Saturday Night Live he's autistic. So Elon Musk, Einstein, no speech in the late three. And then you have some that remain much more severe. They never learn to talk. And there's all different levels in between. Um, and, and, and some have difficulty doing basic skills like dressing themselves. And when they get older, it's kind of crazy that we've got this spectrum that's so broad. Because if you have something like ADHD or dyslexia, okay, dyslexia, you can't read. ADHD, you're distractible. That's much more you know, narrow. Um, but that's the thing. A little bit of autism gives you this technology we're using right now. That's fantastic. Probably had to have some autism genetics that figure out how to create some. So just to help level set our conversation a little bit, I want to focus on the term neurodiversity, because I think that's a great way to put things into perspective a little bit. Uh, we have a quick video that we're going to show now that explains this term, and then we'll come back and discuss it. Let's take a look. This is Jackie, Brian, and Nia. They all like to play with blocks, but they like to play in different ways because they process information in ways that are unique to their own brains. Jackie is autistic, and she lines up her blocks again and again in just the right way. Brian has ADHD. He likes to run around with his blocks and throw them in the air. Nia is neurotypical. She doesn't have autism or ADHD, and she plays with blocks the way most other kids do stacking them in different ways. Today, she's making a castle. Jackie, Brian, and Nia have brains that work differently. They learn about shapes, gravity, and cause and effect. Kids who have ADHD, autism, and other developmental disorders have their own unique strengths and weaknesses, just like Jackie and Brian. But that doesn't mean that they're better or worse. This idea is called neurodiversity. Just like people come in different shapes and sizes, they also come with different types of brains. And if we embrace those differences, all children can learn, grow, and thrive in their own way. So I think that the big takeaway here is that there are many different types of minds out there, right? And they all have their strengths. Um, Temple, uh, Dr. Grannon, I think you said, um, and this really stuck with me, the world needs all types of minds. And oh, while there are, there are a lot of emphasis on STEM thinkers right now, um, this may be leaving behind some kids who think differently. Can you explain a little bit about why you think that? Well, yes. And I, and I talked about that in one of my books, um, The Autistic Brain. I'm an extreme visual thinker. It's that's a science, scientist would call that object visualizer. Because everything I think about is a picture, a photorealistic picture, like a, you know, like PowerPoint slide or like little short videos. And another kind of mind is more mathematical mind. That's the visual spatial. They think in patterns. See, there's the math mind and then the art mind. And then a lot of people are mixtures in between. And then you have the verbal thinker uh, who thinks completely in words. And when I was young, when I was in my 20s, I thought everybody thought in pictures. Because when I started my first work on working with cattle, I noticed they would refuse to go through a shoe that there was a coat hanging on the fence. Other people hadn't thought to look at what cattle were looking at. But to somebody who's a visual thinker, that was completely obvious to me. Science now supports that there's object visualizers, there is the visual, spatial, more mathematical minds, and then the word verbal thinkers who think almost exclusively, exclusively in words and all mixtures in between. Now, these different kinds of minds have complementary skills. Um, let's look at something like Zoom. The visual thinker makes the interface, but the mathematician has to make it work. You see, you need to have both. Like right now, I'm working on another book on visual thinking and working with my super great co-author, Betsy. She's totally verbal. I write the first draft, and then she rearranges it in the most beautiful way. Um, I just don't know how she does it, but I provide the source material. That's different minds working together. She knows how to organize in ways that I don't, but she wouldn't be able to do the same source material. Uh, on so my building projects, I have found that uh, the visual thinkers like me do the layout drawings. They'll lay out an entire factory. They'll have 20 patents for all kinds of clever mechanical equipment. And then the mathematicians have to do the boilers, the refrigeration, 
and make sure the wind load doesn't blow the roof off. You see, again, complementary skills. And I've seen that every construction project I've worked on, especially the ones where I spent a lot of time out on the construction site. So Dr. Moore, if you're a parent, um, how does one identify the type of thinker their child might be? I know in some of the past talks um, that you've done together, um, you've actually shown uh, PET scans of the brain where you can in fact identify those areas that are highlighted, uh, you know, providing some evidence of one way of thinking or another. Could you describe how that uh, is, is an actual uh, physical difference? Well, those scans are not commercially available. That was basically scientists playing around with the latest uh, scanners. And, but let's just look at something that's simpler. When I got to be about seven and eight years old, my drawing ability became very obvious. And visual thinkers tend to draw. Visual thinkers like to build things. And uh, mother always encouraged me to draw lots of different things. The mathematical thinkers are going to be good at math. And some of those kids need to be moved ahead in math. Also, music tends to go with math. So, you know, let's make sure we have access to musical instruments and music lessons. I had access to um, playing a little uh, flute when I was a child. I couldn't figure out how to play it. But you give that to another child, they will just take off on it. And the word thinkers like, right. And they usually are less interested in drawing and blocks. I'm not going to say there's going to be no interest, but you, it, it becomes kind of obvious if kids are exposed to enough different things so that they can kind of you know, show their natural way they'd like to go. Got it. And, and so, Dr. Moore, um, I'd love you to explain a little bit about this contact, uh, concept of mindset. Uh, I know your book is, is really focused on several different mindsets, but how is this uh, an important way to look at the autism spectrum? I think the commonality between all the mindsets is that we want to look at the entire child. The label of autism is simply a part of that child. Uh, there's lots of other pieces of personality, of, of temperament. And if you forget that and you overemphasize the autism, well, number one, you often will overemphasize deficits because that's kind of the definition. When you think of autism and you have the diagnostic criteria, they're not pointing out any of the strengths. They're only pointing out the challenges, but there are just as many strengths. So the mindsets keep coming back to that concept. Think about the whole child, build those strengths, expose that child so that you can find those strengths prepare that child for the real world and do it in a way that talks the language that that child thinks in. Well, I think we've got to expose kids to lots of things. And I get asked all the time, what would I do if I could improve the schools? If I could do one thing, I'd put all the hands-on classes back in art, sewing, woodworking, cooking, theater, um, wood shop, and then high school, auto shop, and welding, and all of these things. You know, my school had theater when I was in elementary school. I wasn't interested in being in the play, but I made sets and costumes. And I did that in high school. And I also did that in college. But, you know, set designers and costumes, that's something that can turn into a career. I mean, this is why it's so important to um, keep these things. And I think taking them out of the school is one of the worst things the schools have done. We've got kids growing up today that are really smart that have never used a tool. I had a student in my college class who had never used a ruler. I have a scale drawing assignment in my livestock handling class. Never used a ruler to measure anything. No, I think we're getting too many kids removed too far away from the world of real stuff. Wow. Um, one of the things that Temple and I come back to also is the dangers of video gaming and the internet because you're not going to be learning the tools and making things if you're sitting in front of a screen all the time. Well, and, 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 and in, the, in the book on navigating autism and another book that you did, The Loving Push, we reviewed the literature on how addictive the video games are and they've designed them to be more and more addictive. Now, what's interesting about Elon Musk is um, he was uh, selling video games and, um, and making them 
but the video games that he would have played, because I checked them out, they, really, they weren't very addictive. Also, the computer would break all the time and show you all this weird code, and then that gets kids into programming. But that's not happening today. I'm seeing some kids playing video games for eight hours a day, and they're not becoming video game designers. We've got to limit it. And then we, I'm not, I don't believe in banning it, but limit it to an hour a day. Same way my TV was limited when I was a child, an hour a day, two hours a day on the weekends. And you could spend that time kind of the way you wanted to that week because they're not having good outcomes. And if you do have an individual that's a really bad video game addict, even a young adult, you have to replace it with something else. And the visual thinkers like me are some of the worst for getting addicted. And there's been some successful replacements with karmic games. Uh, uh, they found that that was more interesting than the video games. Hmm. And would you say the same is true for this potential to be addicted to um, just cell phones and social media? Well, it's the same thing. It's the same, same thing. thing. All of that. Screens. Let's put it on the one big category. Screens. Screens. You know, we need to limit a lot of that stuff. That's why I've done my book, The Outdoor Scientist. These are the things I did outside in the 50s. It's really fun stuff. This is all my aviation experiments. When I did a book signing for this book, uh, for almost uh, just over three years ago, 20 to 30% of the elementary school children in a really nice town right outside of Denver had never made a paper airplane in their life. Well, at that night at that theater, they made them. And they were mm. chucking them off the balcony and having a really great time. That's awesome. Um, yeah, my kids are two of the last holdouts. I refuse to give them a smartphone um, because I think it's it's a crime right now that you, to see the kids, you walk into the school, they're all like this. Instead of talking to each other, they got their faces down. Oh, no, we need to be, um, you know, if there's anything, no, nope, we got to be cutting way down on the screens. Agreed. How old are your kids? My kids are 11 and 13. And you know, so this 13 is year old, I'm sure is clamoring for a smartphone. Oh yeah. Clamoring. You don't even know how much clamor, but well, the other thing, if you do get one, the way that well, when it's charged, it charges like in your bedroom or something. So that... yeah, we got her the most uh, unsexy phone that they can make, which is just a phone with a black and white Kindle screen. It can make calls and send texts and that's it. There's no apps. There's no fun and games. There's a calculator. That's it. It's, it's boring, but it's, you know, if there's an emergency, it works. And you and have that's a all phone. we need. Yeah, exactly. So yes, I'm glad I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let them watch your film temple. And then I'm going to say, see, she agrees with the crazy mom here. Um, so this brings us to the Geico moment. Um, we asked some members of the scary mommy community to respond from a quote from you, Dr. Grandin, where you said, the most important thing people did for me was to expose me to new things. Yeah. So in, in response to that quote, uh, we have a question that was submitted by Lara C. And she has this to say about her 11-year-old son. My son resists everything new that I try to expose him to. It's almost meltdown inducing. So I worry that the struggle will be more stressful than the reward I'm hoping he will gain. How do I decrease the meltdown probability and increase the desire for that reward? One of the things is, is give a choice of the things to try. That's something that will help. The other thing is we got to watch out for sensory problems. I was really sensitive to loud noises like the school bell going off. And one of the best ways to maybe gotten me over that is when school is not in session, you go down to the principal's office and let me just press the button, press the button. Because sometimes you can get a child over being afraid of a noise like that if they can initiate it. Same thing with the buzzer on the scoreboard in the gym, air dryers, vacuum cleaners, any of those noisy things. When I was five, I was terrified. Giant vacuum cleaner that Mr. Russell, the janitor, had. And what should have been done was to let me turn it on and watch the bag inflate. You know, it's not going to suck me up. Um, but I, I need to learn a little more about this kid, uh, what kind of activities they were. But mother always gave me choices of activities. It's important to stretch these kids. You don't just force them into a super loud Walmart. Okay, if a child is having a meltdown at Walmart, 
let them have control. Take them there when it's not busy. And maybe when they do this hand signal, you'll take them out. Or if they're, if they're visually sensitive and they hate automatic doors, then take them over there when it's not busy and let them play with the doors where they control. That's one of the keys on helping desensitize some of the sensory problems because they are real. And they'd be the one area where I need, they'd be, there's a lot more research that needs to be done on treatments for the sensory problems. That is a great tip for parents. Um, and so, you know, in, in discussing, um, you know, some of these fears or sensitivities, um, we may see children who have repetitive movements or have hyper focus on certain things um, that neurotypical adults may find challenging in, in some situations. Um, what advice would you have for parents in these moments when they're really struggling? Um, First, okay, sorry I interrupt. This is a problem we okay. still have. I can't time uh, when I'm supposed to be talking no and problem. I interrupt, but I need more information. I used to do some repetitive behavior when I needed to calm down and mother would give me a time and a place to do it like after lunch in my room or to wind up the swing and spin around it, those sorts of things. And then there's some individuals that are nonverbal that can't actually control the movements. And there's some very, very good books like, um, here's a new one right here, uh, just came out. This is a girl who types by herself. I've been buried under years of dust. Then there's Tito Makapadahe, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? There's the Noki um, Reason I Jump and then the sequel. And Noki describes um, not being able to control his movements. So we've got to figure out what's causing the repetitive movement. There's a tendency, and this is where you verbal thinkers, you overgeneralize. I have to ask enough questions until I can make a little video in my head of what the kid's actually doing. Then I can start to um, troubleshoot it. You know, is, it, is there a sensory issue? I, what exactly is going on here? Okay, maybe Deborah, you might want to have something to say. Um, I'm not sure I have anything to add to that. That was that was a good explanation, Temple. But it's way too vague. And I get this all the time. And I have to ask many, many more questions. Where is repetitive behavior going? Because I got to figure out, is it repetitive behavior to calm down? Or is it a nonverbal individual that can't control the movements? Mm -hmm. They're two different things. So it really depends on the situation. Is uh, is, is a label? Is yeah, it's such a broad range of symptoms, from a socially awkward tech guy to somebody that uh, can't control their movements and has trouble getting dressed. One thing I would say is if possible, and it's not always possible, you want to distinguish between, is this behavior a communication okay. of stress or is it a self-soothing behavior? Because you're going to react very differently to those two things. Well, the other thing on meltdowns, I kind of go through a checklist on this. The first thing I got to rule out is if, especially if the individual is non-verbal or partially verbal, uh, is there a hidden painful medical problem? Yes. A tummy ache, an earache, acid reflux, those sort of things that are treatable. Um, is it happening in a noisy, chaotic place, train station, a, a super busy Walmart? You see, that could be sensory. Um, and then the other big thing is frustration with not being able to communicate. I can remember the frustration of not being able to communicate. You've got to give a nonverbal kid a way to communicate. Some people are teaching them sign language until they learn language. You know, there's fancy communication devices. There's a piece of cardboard with the pictures on it, but they've got to have ways to communicate. And then there, then there's some that are purely behavioral. I remember pitching some fits just to get out of doing something, pitch a fit to get attention. And, they, and the child was selective on who he would throw the fit with that he could manipulate but I want to rule out sensory communication and painful medical first. And then there are a few individuals where it's actually a psychomotor seizure and they're very, very difficult to diagnose. But if a, if a meltdown comes out of the blue in a calm environment, and there's nothing in, uh, to trigger. It. it might be a psychomotor epilepsy and it just comes on like a switch and you're not in a noisy place. Um, and then that needs to be treated with epilepsy drugs 
Only problem is it's extremely difficult to diagnose because you have to do a sleeping EEG with no sedatives. Otherwise you wreck the EEG. That is fascinating. So it really does depend specifically on the child and there's a lot of careful uh, observation, it sounds like that has to go on to determine, is this a biological issue? Is there some That's other right. pain stimulating this or triggering well, this? See, if you, let's say you have a slight older child that's been good and now and is nonverbal. And all of a sudden he's horrible. I want to check out the painful medical issue. There was that one kid sense. a long time ago, I saw the beam way up his nose here and he got infected. And that um, had a really bad effect on his behavior. Ouch. So I, I know you both mentioned this term of labeling. So I want to discuss this a little bit um, because I know you've, you've described in the past how labeling at a very young age may keep uh, parents or physicians from recognizing or encouraging the unique skills and strengths that a child has. Uh, could you speak to some of the, um, the dangers of these labels? Um, Deborah, maybe you want to address that. Sure. You know, we need the labels because we need to get the resources and you can't get the resources if you don't have a label. But once you have that label, you have to remember something. It's the same child that you had before you got the label. Nothing changed. So remember that. It's, it's scary. It's, it's hard for a parent. But get your resources in line and then get back to who that kid is. What do they like? What do they enjoy? What are they interested in? The other thing for me, I managed to get through elementary school without being bullied because Mrs. Beach, my teacher, used a method that's now called peer mediated intervention. That's a fancy word for that. She told the other students that I had a disability and it was not visible like a wheelchair and that they needed to be on. Um, helping me, not torturing me. High school was horrible, bullying and teasing. And the only places I was not bullied and teased were friends through shared interests. That's how autistic kids get friends. For me, it was horses, model rockets, and electronics. For another kid, it could be cooking, it could be um, sewing, it could be music, it could be a lot of different things. Friends through shared interests. Uh, Really, really important. I've got a paper online uh, titled um, "How a Te How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism Learn Make Friends and Learn How to Work." Wow. Um, and so, I imagine there would be some situations where this label could actually be a relief to explain some of the past struggles that they may have had, if, if that be in relationships or making friends or, or other uh, parts of their life. Uh, is that something you've seen? That's especially true of adults. You know, adult, uh, may, you know, may and they are the fully verbal end of the spectrum. They, they've gotten out and they got a job and stuff, but their relationships are going bad. That's where the label does give a sense of relief because now they know why they're socially awkward. But what I'm concerned about is I'm seeing too many kids where they're not learning basic skills, not learning shopping, things I learned when I was seven. And I just went to our county fair last week and it made me think about how my mother gave me 50 cents a week for allowance. And my sister and I would save for an entire month that we could blow it on rides at the, and games at the county fair. And we were very young kids and that taught really important skills. I could get five comics with 50 cents, but if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save. And kids are not learning that. And, and they're not learning things like ordering food in restaurants. And the other big thing is working skills that needs to start with chores with little kids. And I have granddads that come up to me all the time. And the granddads tell me, that they discovered they were autistic when the grandkids or their children got diagnosed. Granddad has a decent job. And he had a paper route at age 11. We're gonna to have to replace that with other things. Church volunteer jobs, volunteering at the farmer's market, instant, they're legal. They need to be getting real jobs. And we've got to be careful about the multitasking. Don't put them on a crazy takeout window. That's, uh, that's not gonna work. You see academic skills and um, work skills are totally different skills. And to have a good transition from you know teenagerhood to adulthood 
the more fully verbal end of the spectrum, they need to hold down two jobs before they graduate from high school, preferably two different jobs. I had a lot of work experience. My mother got me out to my aunt's ranch. Um, I was painting signs and selling them. Um, I spent three years um, running a horse barn in our school. Didn't do any studying, but boy, I learned how to run a horse barn. I really was good at cleaning salts. <laughs> and I'm realizing now that learning that work skill was just so important. Being on time, I was responsible, for feeding them correctly, putting them in and out. And how do you, what advice would you give for parents um, to help their children stretch? You hear these stories where the doctor will say, oh, he'll never be verbal or she'll oh, never no, go no, to no, college. No, I, I, that, that's how do you too pessimistic? No, you have to, and, and Deborah's shaking her head there. You've got to stretch. We don't go shopping them in. I use visual analogies. We don't chuck them in the deep end of the pool. You've got to gradually stretch doing new things, giving choices of new things they can try. Um, when I was 15, I was afraid to go to the ranch. Mother gave me a choice. I could go for a week and come home or I could stay all summer. I got out there and I loved it. I've talked to other moms. She got her kid to, to go to a sleepaway camp. Turned out he loved it. No, you've got to get, you know, get them out doing different things, trying different things. So um, baby steps, giving them choices. Well, you do it in small steps. Okay, let's say with the shopping. Um, I had a 12-year-old girl come up to me at one of the airports, and I found out from her mom she'd never shopped. I pulled $5 out of my purse, and I said, go over to that store across the hall and buy something. Now, we could see the, the door. It was just across the hall. She went and bought a drink, brought it back gave me the change that was her first shopping i'm you know recommending those kind of baby steps and then gradually increase it but i'm i'm seeing some moms that have trouble letting go and you've got a 16 year old good student in school who's never gone shopping you've got to be kidding so how does a how does a parent balance the need to protect their child versus overprotecting which may well, be you limiting see, as a visual thinker I'm seeing a newsstand across the hall where we could both sit there and look at the door of the place. You could see it. Or let's say I'm thinking another good place would be, okay, you're putting gas in the car and you tell the kid to run in the little shop and, and buy some milk or some other thing. And you're right there. You can pick the gas station where you can see in the window of the shop. You see, to me, it's not abstract. I'm actually picking out a particular gas station in Fort Collins where I could look into the shop while I was pumping the gas and I'm, I'm going to pump the gas. That's for grownups. But we're going to send the 10 year old in there to buy something in the shop where I can see it, see them through the window. But you see, it's not abstract. And then, then, then you might be shopping at a supermarket and I'm seeing our King Supers. I'm going to send the kid next door to the um, office supply store to buy some stuff, office supplies that they don't have at King Supers. At the stores are next to each other. That you makes see, a lot I of sense. I see it. I see the things thing. I would say. I mean, I'm seeing particular stores that I shop in. One of the things I would say is don't be afraid that your kid's going to not be able to do something. Let them try anyway. It's fine to fail. That's how we learn. And if you're not letting the kid fail, you're probably not pushing hard enough because that's just going to be part of learning new, new behaviors and new skills. And the other thing I would say is, especially for moms, moms and dads tend to be a little bit different on this. Dads tend to push a little bit more and be, be okay with that. Moms got really used to protecting when the kid was younger and sometimes they keep doing it even though the kid's kind of outgrown that. Check your own anxiety, check that at the door because if that's what's holding you back, you could be confusing that with your child's anxiety. Maybe your child's not as anxious as you are in which case that's kind of a disservice to your child. So you really, I had to work with moms as much as I had to work with kids. They, their anxiety was sometimes what was holding them back, not the kid. If you found something that the kid was interested in, they were ready to try it. Well, that's a really, really good point. And I think one of the, another problem we got today with a lot of kids, even, even the so-called normal kids is they're afraid to make mistakes. And I think that goes back to not doing hands-on things. Like one of the projects within my, Calling all minds book is making a paper snowflake. I couldn't believe it when I held this up at a Zoom call within the last 12 months. I had a teacher asking in all seriousness, what's going to happen to a kid's self-esteem 
if the snowflake falls apart. I go, you get another piece of paper out of the printer and you try again. <laughs> and then maybe you look it up on YouTube how to make it. And then maybe get someone to show you how to make it. Well, you just have to try again. In my, my, one of the projects I did as a young kid was a little bird kite that I flew behind my bicycle. It started out with my trike, actually. And I had to tinker and tinker and tinker to get this bird kite to work. You see, and I think um, this taking out of all the hands-on stuff also makes kids more afraid of uh, making mistakes. Now you learn from mistakes. So I wrecked a sewing project. I was about 12, cut the fabric too hastily, was not able to get more fabric. The store had no more of the same fabric. And uh, I learned from that is be more careful before you cut it. So you've mentioned that these hands-on things like sewing and woodworking and welding actually are teaching problem solving. Exactly. Can, you, can exactly. you talk about that a little bit? I think it's important to teach problem solving. They've got to figure out how to do something. There's so, so then, many things involved in, in making something. You, you've got to be able to think of cause and effect. You've got to be able to think about timing. You've got to think about how to start something and build steps. You have to know when something is finished. If you're working with another person, you have to learn to take turns. You have to learn to take instruction or read instruction. So it's not just, you know, finding something to keep your kid busy. It's truly teaching valuable, valuable life skills. And I think sometimes we emphasize the academic skills way too much. There's no reason for a kid to learn, for instance, algebra, if they're not going to use algebra. And a lot of kids on the spectrum, well, that's I'm one of, Well, this is one of the things I'm concerned about with the visual thinkers, like maybe object visualize. I can't do algebra. Never have passed an algebra class. I managed to get through the college math because it was um, uh, probability matrices and statistics. Had to be tutored to get through statistics, barely wobbled through that. And, but the thing is, you need visual thinkers to solve problems. Like, horrible Fukushima nuclear power plant mess. That would have been saved if they put watertight doors in it. Engineers calculate risk. Well, I can see water coming over the seawall and what do you think is gonna to happen to the electrically operated emergency cooling pump? See how basic that is? I can't design a nuclear reactor. I just know that pump's gotta run when I need it. It won't run when it's drained. It's that basic. You see, this is where I'm realizing you know, the verbal thinkers and some of the math minds, they didn't see that. Right. Watertight doors, ancient, simple technology would have prevented that. So I think what you're saying is really a lesson for all of those who work at businesses and have companies and that are you know, putting together teams of people. Um, when we That's talk right. about diversity on our teams, diversity can come in many different forms. And so neurodiversity seems like such a key element that you don't hear people talk about when, you know, they're putting together a team to work on a project. Um, you know, just your examples that you've given about the, the plant uh, technical problems, uh, having those thinkers, you know, with different ways of uh, attacking problems seems like the best way to find, you know, the solution or the invention or the, you know, the patent that you're, you're trying to come up with. Is that fair to say? Well, that's absolutely right. Now, I didn't know that there was such a thing as verbal or math thinking until I was in my 30s. It was a shock. You see, and people ask, well, how do we help get these diverse minds to work together? The first thing you have to realize is that they exist. That's the first thing. And then a lot of people are mixtures of, of the different kinds of thinking. But when you have a label, you often tend to be extreme mathematician, extreme visual, or extreme word person. And... And I've looked at all kinds of things where, they, where these different ways that people think uh, can be complementary skills. And, and, and we've, I had to learn how to work together. The first thing is recognizing that there are differences. Um, and then the visual thinking often is not given enough credit. I was just on uh, I think, uh, NASA, .com, uh, NASA website and looking at the latest Mars rover pictures, they're beautiful, beautiful. And I looked up the company that made the camera for the Mars rover. It's got beautiful hand-done wiring all over. Somebody on a workbench made that camera. That is a beautiful camera. I couldn't believe the pictures that it took. You see, that's why the hands-on people often don't get enough credit. 
I mean, and somebody and built that thing by hand. They may have used machine parts made on computerized equipment, but you still need all the different kinds of mines. And I think what what I I'm just in in thinking about my own experiences is in working in different environments. Um, perhaps we need to be a little more uh, welcoming or aware of the different ways that our colleagues or our partners or other, our friends, or, you know, for kids at school, uh, a little more awareness about how these differences might present themselves. Um, so would you have any advice? I know you mentioned peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, resolution of, of problems. Um, what is some advice for parents who have maybe a neurotypical child uh, when they are in an interaction with a child that may be on the spectrum? How can that child help support the other? Well, I, in the 50s, they used a method of parenting that I've named teachable moments. And I think that's another reason why the grandfathers managed to get decent jobs and keep them. Uh, we'd sit down at the dining room table, and when I made a mistake, like um, sticking my fingers in the mashed potatoes or pick up meat in my hand or something like that, mother didn't scream no. She'd say, use the fork. She'd give the instruction. And if I went over to the next door neighbor's kid's house for lunch, the next door neighbor mom would give the instruction. In the 50s, grown-ups corrected little kids and they didn't scream at them. They tell you what you should do. One specific example at, at a time. You see, it's not, it's not a vague generality. One specific example at a time of teaching manners. And, and, uh, and the same thing in the workplace. A boss needs to you know, pull an autistic person aside and say, no, you can't tell the John that he's stupid, uh, that you're gonna have to apologize for that. Also, um, uh, in the workplace, you need very specific to know exactly what you're supposed to do in the job. You know, it has to be clear. Don't just say straighten up the store. You need to tell them, well, you've gotta make sure that all the shampoos, um, uh, the price of the shampoo that's on the scanner matches the label that's on the front of the shelf. You see that being an example of a specific instruction. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, Dr. Grandin, in your book, you discuss strengths versus interests and how these can be combined oh, to help a child learn and grow. Can you tell us about how this That's super important works? because people yeah. mix up strengths versus interests. A strength would be being an object visualizer, visual thinking, art, being good at art, building things, being good at mechanical things, good at mathematics. That's a strength. Good at music, good at writing. That's a strength. Now, an interest would be something like cars or dogs or, you know, the Mars rover. Those would be examples of interests. And when I was a little kid, I would draw the same horse head over and over again. And mother encouraged me to draw many different things. What you want to do is broaden. Let's draw the entire horse. Let's draw the saddle. You know, you want to broaden it. Um, we could read about... Um, some of the people that worked on the Mars rover, you broaden that interest so it's less fixated. But that's the difference between an interest and a strength. Got it. That is very helpful. Um, and so when we're thinking about interventions for our child, sometimes as parents, we want to spring into action. We want to, you know, help them in any way possible. Um, can you speak to us about uh, some of the traditional ways that parents can seek out resources for their child versus some of the non-traditional ways that may be uh, very low cost and may well, uh, leverage a two-year-old is not talking, the worst thing you can do is nothing. There's a lot of differences in the U.S. and other places in the world on how many services are available. And so the first thing I want to do with a two-year-old that's not talking is I want to make sure they're not deaf. You might just have to do some simple things like clap your hands behind their head and make a noise behind their head and see if they turn their head. Um, you rule that out, or you rule out something wrong with the throat. You rule that out. And if you can get services, great, but I don't want to wait two years for a diagnosis because I want to start working with that kid now. So you might get some grandmothers at the church or next door neighbors uh, to start working with the kid on learning words, learning to take turns. And I've observed that some teachers have a natural ability to work with these kids 
they know just how hard to push and they get progress. And other teachers, they'll push them too hard and they'll end up going into sensory overload and, and meltdowns, but you've got to work with them. And other things we need to look at our resources in the neighborhood. Um, another thing that was done with me to teach social skills that was done in our neighborhood was when I was about seven or eight, my sister and I, and we had to put our good clothes on. Parents had a party, we greeted the guests and we served the snacks. And the guests would also correct the kids. You see, this is something the neighborhood did. That also helped uh, teach social skills. Maybe with older kids, we seek out a retiree that can teach an art class, um, uh, teach some auto shop. Uh, there's more, even in, in low income neighborhoods, there's more resources there than you'd think. You know, I walk by little shops and I'm going, hmm, that might be a great place to put a 12 year old you know, to learn a few, a few um, skills. But you see, it's not abstract to me. As a visual thinker, I start seeing specific examples. I remember going through, um, I was down in Chile when we were driving and I was picking, there were all these little shops and I was picking out the ones I thought might be good. I don't want anything dangerous, but places where the child could just start learning some work skills. We've just got to look at what's available there in the neighborhood and there's more available than what a lot of parents think. When I start to question them and I start knowing, who do you know that owns a store? Who do you know that likes to garden? Maybe you can get your kid helping out with the garden. That is great. And so um, I'm going to start now with a few questions that are coming in from our live audience who's mm -hmm. watching. And on this topic of activities for kids, uh, one parent is asking, what activities would you suggest the kids do to practice social skills safely during this pandemic? Well, turn-taking skills is one of the things. And what some of our families did is they formed quarantine groups where, where they, they interacted with, you know, maybe two or three other families where everybody was being really careful. Um, we've got to get social interaction. Fortunately, during COVID here, our little nursery school that we've got right next to where I live, stayed open most of the time. Made me so happy to see three-year-olds out there riding their trikes and interacting with other three-year-olds. That's what three-year-olds are gonna, I've got to be doing. I um, mean, take sensible precautions. Uh, I read the research on COVID, it's mostly airborne. And so outdoor is a whole lot safer. Masks reduce spread. Yep. Um, and, and I, uh, there are a lot of research now on upping ventilation rates in buildings and things like that because it's a, it's a, airborne is the main mode of transmission. That's latest information from top science magazines like Science and Nature. Okay, so next question here is, when a child is falling behind milestones, what is the best way to advocate for early intervention? Well, okay, when I say milestones, I'm considered walking, things like that. Well, yes. you're going to have to rule out, you know, physical causes, something that might be tradable, but you need to do something about it. Uh, or the child's not talking. I don't want to, you have a two-year-old that's not talking. We don't want to wait two years to do nothing. No, you got to do something about it. And I would encourage moms who take their kid to the doctor. And if the doctor says, oh, Johnny's not talking, but you know, he's a boy. Sometimes boys don't talk and let's wait and see. If mom feels like in her gut, no, this isn't right. I've learned to trust moms. And I've had too many clients who were told just wait and they just wasted a year. And that you can't get that year back. So my advice to moms is, is trust your gut. You've got to be your kid's advocate. It's, it's hard and it's tiring, but, but you can't rely on the professionals all the time. No, that's really good. And also getting, I always, people call me, I say, get involved with your local support group and talk to other parents. Uh, I think that's a really important thing to do. Here's another question from a mom who's, who's doing just this. Uh, my son is on the spectrum. He is also ADD, ADHD, dyslexic, and has dysgraphia. I, think, I hope I'm saying that right. I wouldn't change him for the world. I am actually going back to school to be a special education teacher. 
What are some things you would recommend for me to make sure I don't fail a kid? Well, let's not let them get addicted to video games. Also, there's a lot of a crossover between ADHD and autism. It crosses over about 20 or 30 percent of the genetics, brain scan data, and the way the kids behave. Um, let's get them in, involved in doing a lot of things, develop his strengths. I'm a big believer in that. Mother worked hard to develop my ability in art, and I use that in my work in designing livestock facilities. Great. Um, here's another question. Um, can you talk about the idea of putting your autistic child in the least restrictive environment? That's in quotes. How does this contribute to the growth of your child? Are there any negative aspects to be aware of? Well, I'll tell you stuff I don't want to see. Because again, that's very, very vague. I'll tell you what I don't want to see. And I saw this one time. A really nice school for autistic kids, but mostly nonverbal autistic kids. I saw a 12 year old, smart 12 year old, maybe should be in a gifted and talented program in that school. That I don't want to see. I was mainstreamed into a normal school, but it had very small classes. If I had been in a school with 30 students, I probably would have needed to have an aid. Um, there are a lot of kids that will need an aid, um, but I want to see the autistic kid interacting as much as they can with normal kids. And a lot of this is specific in certain schools too. There's huge differences. Um, and the other, the other thing I'm always asking parents, is your kid progressing? Are you making progress? Is he learning? But um, I don't want to say put in the regular classroom and then you do nothing with them. Do, yes, you don't want it to be stagnant. It depends so much upon the particular school. There's so much variation. <clears throat> not so much public versus private, but there's an engineering term called site specific, which simply means this school might be really great and this one over here is terrible. Or it might be the particular principal, the particular teachers, particular people involved. And I think it's really good to have an individual educational plan, but you can go crazy. It doesn't have to be 30 pages long. Uh, mother got together with a small school and if I had a bad day, the teacher would call and she'd come and pick me up. And, and mother and school worked together as a team. Also, the rules were the same at home and school. If I had a tantrum, the rule was no television that night, period. Very calmly, you know, consistently applied. And always working on, on things to develop strengths. That you know, I think you need to go visit different schools too. There's a tendency to be talking about the stuff way too abstractly. And what may work for one child in a school, highly successful, lots of progress may not be the right fit for another child. So that's absolutely right. So to your point, visit the school. And I think uh, Dr. Murray, you said it, mother's gut is very important in this whole prog process. If you don't feel like it's a good fit and you don't, there's something off, you got to keep pushing and asking and fighting for the needs of your But the child. other thing, I've seen moms overprotect. I'll never forget a mom get a 16 year old boy, fully verbal. And I suggested that he go to the store and buy something. And she says, I can't let go. Fully verbal, good student in school, had never gone shopping, teenager. Yeah, you see that this is where the mom's getting too much into the label and not seeing the kid. I'm looking at the kid and I'm going, well, he looks like he ought to go work for one of the tech companies. Um, he needs to learn how to do shopping. Let them stretch a little bit. So here's one last question for the audience from the audience before we wrap up. My son struggles with eating. We don't have the age here, but um, any tips for helping him with his sensory issues around eating? Oh. Let's get a chance to play with food. So you get them involved in food prep. I don't want them playing with food in the dining room table. I want to make it very clear. We have manners at the dining room table, but in the kitchen, we can play all around with it, gush it in your hands, feel it, help cook it and make it. And, and the more they explore different things, we will try a little bit. And I'd start with the things that are not the top list of hates. Because sometimes that's, that's a helpful thing to do that's easy to do 
Great tip. Oh, and sorry, we have one more. I'm squeezing in one more quickly here from the fatherly folks. Uh, typically, would autistic children benefit more from homeschooling or public school where they can get more peer interaction? Well, it depends how you do it. I, what I don't like is a homeschool situation where there's no interaction with other children. Now, there's some very big homeschool groups where, where they're getting lots of interaction with homeschool group activities. You know, then that would be just fine. I, but what I don't want to see is the kid just is at home and he never interacts with other kids. That see, again, that sense. depends upon how you do it. The other thing I want to see is progress. More social skills, more academic skills, more live, daily life skills. I think um, one point about a lot of the questions that we get asked is that there's an assumption that because your child's autistic, there's this umbrella answer. And there's not. And it really depends on each child. And that's the point of emphasizing mindsets. That's the point of emphasizing that you've got to see the whole child. And again, what's right for one child may be totally wrong for another child. It doesn't matter that they both got the exact same diagnosis. They could have the same five diagnoses, the same level of functioning, and still have very different needs. The same child, one child can have very different needs when they're five versus when they're five and a half or six. Things change developmentally, environments change. So there's, I know we all want nice, answers, but you've really got to know your child. You've really got to get down to very specifics. Um, and that, that applies to clinicians, to teachers, and to parents. And to stop comparing your child to other kids yeah. across the board is, is never going to be a good thing, right? Um, well, thank you so much. We are almost out of time, but I want to let everyone know that our next live event will be on September 8th, and it is about back to school, back to COVID. We will be talking about what we know now on vaccines and variants. This is top of every parent's mind right now with kids as we return to school. So register now at scarymommy.com slash live, work, thrive. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists, Dr. Temple Grandin and Dr. Deborah Moore, co-authors of Navigating Autism, Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids on the Spectrum. The book will be released September 21st, so pick up a copy. Uh, I think I'm gonna read this because I'm, I'm so fascinated by all the work you're both doing. Have a great night, Scary Mommies, and all the fatherly folks out there who've tuned in. Here's to rethinking autism and embracing its positives as we work to help our children on the spectrum live, work, and thrive. Good night, everyone. Yeah.